Ladies and gentlemen, our title tonight is Should We Fear Artificial Intelligence? And I want to start with something familiar to us, and that is robots. What is a robot? A typical robot in an automotive factory. It's designed to do one or a few other jobs that used to be done by an intelligent human. A robot itself is not intelligent, but it simulates intelligence. There is no learning involved in what it does. And one of the most important things is that its simulated intelligence is decoupled from consciousness. It is an unconscious machine. And we move on now to artificial intelligence, which is not robotics. Robots are increasingly being fitted with AI systems. But in the abstract, an AI system uses mathematical algorithms, that is, set of step-by-step -step instructions. They're embedded in computer software. And the effect of it is to sort, filter, and select from, and this is crucial, a huge database. Artificial intelligence involves learning, in inverted commas. The system can learn to identify and interpret digital patterns, for example, images, sounds, speech, text, data, etc. And then it uses computer techniques to analyze a huge database statistically and estimate the probability of a particular hypothesis. So what this system does is to take information about the past, a lot of it, and makes decisions or predictions about the future. Now that sounds all very abstract, but we're totally familiar with it. Alexa and Siri are digital assistants, are AI systems, and it's perhaps easier to understand when we just go back a step to online shopping. For example, with Amazon, each one of us leaves a track, and it's a track of data, what we bought, when we bought it, and that is built up and built up as well as the information from millions of other people. So that when you just dip into Amazon and you think you're going to buy a new yacht, and so you have a look at the latest yachts in Bermuda. It won't surprise you tomorrow if suddenly up pops a little window and says, by the way, would you like to look at our latest range of yachts? That's an AI system that has been following you, tracking you, and filtering through all the information and predicting something that you might like to be interested in. In medicine, the achievements are spectacular. AI systems have now been developed that, for example, you get an X-ray of your lungs because your doctor suspects you may have some illness. The AI system compares that X-ray with hundreds of thousands of others and comes out almost instantaneously with a diagnosis, and the diagnosis is usually much more accurate than the best human doctors on Earth. And we're moving in the direction where diagnosis will be made routinely by artificial intelligence systems. Autonomous vehicles, they are run by artificial intelligence systems. And they raise increasingly ethical questions because the system has to be programmed with some kind of morality, because no machine is a conscience. And so what do you avoid? What do you allow the car to hit? That's a hugely difficult problem, and people are working on the ethics of autonomous vehicles. Then we come to job search, and professional people these days are faced 
with an additional complexity when it comes to their job seeking. <laughs> because the human interviewer is now regarded as not adequate. So you go in for interview, but you're interviewed by a battery of sophisticated cameras that are watching every move, every blink of your eyelid, every pulse in the arteries in your head, and they are assessing your emotional stability. So now professional people are finding they have to prepare themselves, not simply for facing a human interviewer, but before they get anywhere near a human interviewer, they have to overcome this hugely complex hurdle of passing these kind of artificial intelligence tests. And you can see there is danger of bias and prejudice. So an enormous amount of work is being done to try and filter the prejudice out so that, for example, the system doesn't prefer Irishmen over everybody else. <laughs> then there's crime prevention. Face recognition has achieved great strides. And we are, of course, thankful that the police can pick criminals out of a crowd. That's the upside. But every technology has a downside. And the face recognition and CCTV cameras that are used to catch criminals can be used for social control and surveillance. In England at the moment, there are more closed circuit TV cameras than in the whole of North America. China is putting 600 million CCTV cameras into its country this year. And they are developing social control. It's already operating in 13 cities. And the basic idea, they will probably modify it a little, is that each citizen is given 300 points. And people are tracked. They're observed. And if they're seen buying something that the authorities think might be a waste of time or going to a questionable place, they lose points. And then they begin to discover that their credit card won't be accepted, or that they can't get onto a train, or they can't go to their favorite restaurant, or they do things that are regarded as good, and their point score goes up, and they may be able to buy a new car. And there's been a time argument, a time article about it that uh, makes really scary reading. It's saying it's setting the stage for the most thorough form of surveillance the world has ever seen and setting up the perfect conditions for an absolute dictatorship. But then at the end of the article, the writer warns, he said, by the way, all of these systems exist in the West. The only difference is they're not centralized yet. You have credit surveys when you want to buy something. You have the police checking you as you drive down the toll roads. There are all kinds of things happening to us socially, but they are checked by different agencies. It could all come together so that you can see that AI, which is excellent for crime prevention, could threaten privacy as it has already done with Facebook and so on. Then we move on to things that raise even bigger ethical questions. That is autonomous weapons, killing people simply by computer, and the AI systems themselves deciding what the targets are going to be and dealing with them before there's any human intervention at all. All these things are already operating. And I'd like to emphasize that this is what is called narrow artificial intelligence. Remember, an AI system does something that normally requires an intelligent human. It simulates intelligence, but it does it in a very limited area. It might be face recognition. It might be dealing with x-rays, etc. It's a limited area, and it it decouples intelligence from consciousness. Now, we need to therefore remember, as Roger Shank of Northwestern University wrote, cognition means thinking.
Your machine is not thinking. When people say AI, they don't mean AI. What they mean is a lot of brute force computation. Perhaps the man who said it best is a professor from Alabama who gave a remarkable lecture in 1985 in Yale. And he said, it seems to me that a lot of needless debate could be avoided if AI researchers would admit that there are fundamental differences between machine intelligence and human intelligence, differences that cannot be overcome by any amount of research. In other words, the artificial in artificial intelligence is real. And that was the title of his article. And very interestingly, he was a Christian. And there were several Nobel Prize winners at that lecture in Yale. And one of them was the famous Sir John Eccles, who thought this was an excellent presentation. The artificial in artificial intelligence is real. So much for the things where we can see positive benefits, but dangers. But now we're going to come to something very different. And that is the quest for artificial general intelligence. That is building an AI system that equals or exceeds human capacities. In other words, constructing a super intelligence. And that is often referred to as transhumanism. We go beyond the human. And these ideas are being spread abroad prolifically around the world in many books, but notably a number of bestsellers. The first one I want to bring to your attention is Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari, an Israeli historian. It's called A Brief History of Tomorrow. Now, I think this is so important that the ideas I'm presenting you tonight are going to appear very soon, I hope, in a book. Listen to Harari's analysis of where we have got to in global society. First of all, he says, war is obsolete. You are more likely to commit suicide than be killed in conflict. Secondly, famine is disappearing. You are more at risk from obesity than starvation. And thirdly, death is now just a technical medical problem. This is very much like Steven Pinker's thesis. Now, there are loads of questions that we could ask about this because it's not a thesis that is admitted by everybody by far. But let's look at what Harari builds on this. Granted that these things are so, he says, in the 21st century, we have two major agenda items. Firstly, there's going to be a serious bid for human immortality. Not meaning that humans won't ever die, but meaning that they won't ever have to die. The technical problem of death will be solved. And therefore, humankind can concentrate on the second agenda item, which is an intensification of the pursuit of human happiness. How is that to be achieved? It would be necessary, he writes, to change our biochemistry and re-engineer our bodies and minds so that we shall need to re-engineer Homo sapiens so that it can enjoy everlasting pleasure. Having raised humanity above the beastly level of survival struggles, we will now aim to upgrade humans into gods and turn Homo sapiens into Homo Deus. Now this book is selling in millions and influencing millions of people. And so he reaches the state where his view is this, humankind is poised to replace natural selection with intelligent design and extend life from the organic realm into the inorganic. He's not the only voice. The director of engineering at Google is a very famous, brilliant scientist called Ray Kurzweil. 
He's written a book called The Singularity in which he argues that within the foreseeable future, possibly as few as 30 years, it's always just about 30 years ahead, this. <laughs> AI robots will overtake humans in their intelligence and capabilities. Another very serious and brilliant physicist is Max Tegmark of Princeton. Success in the quest for artificial intelligence has the potential, he writes, to bring unprecedented benefits to humanity. And it is therefore worthwhile to research how to maximize these benefits while avoiding potential pitfalls. And in a TED talk earlier this year, he said, in creating AI, we are birthing a new form of life with unlimited potential for good or for ill. And perhaps one of the most eminent scientists in the world today is our Lord Race, who's the Astronomer Royal. We can have zero confidence, he wrote recently, that the dominant intelligences a few centuries hence will have any emotional resonance with us even though they may have an algorithmic understanding of the way we behaved. Now, this is not some fictional writer. This is one of the world's top physicists and astronomers. And people are taking this kind of thing seriously. There are other people taking it seriously. Maybe you've seen that name before. And I was interested to have Dan Brown's latest novel drawn to my attention. And when I opened it, I discovered that what he's doing in a fictional way and influencing millions, because millions read his books, so we need to take seriously what the philosophy is in them. Two big questions. Where do I come from and where am I going? And he explains in interviews his motivation is to see if God can survive science. Now, of course, I have dedicated a large part of my life to point out that God can not only survive science, that science points to God, and it doesn't make sense without him. So it intrigued me that here's a novelist using a fictional argument to try to explore these two questions. It gets very interesting. Because the hero, if you like, or the anti-hero of the book, is a billionaire, of course, entrepreneurial artificial intelligence expert called Edmund Kirsch. And what he does is to use narrow AI of the sort that works and we're familiar with to predict AGI. And here's how he does it. The first question is, where do we come from? He goes back to a famous experiment for which Miller and Urey won the Nobel Prize in 1953. They took a simulated prebiotic atmosphere, put it in a test tube, and passed electrical sparks through it. And they discovered a residue in the test tube of several amino acids that are necessary for biological life. So what he now does, it's actually very clever, but what he now does is do a little bit of research and discover that those test tubes, now this is actually true, this happened. Those test tubes were put away in a cupboard for over 50 years. We're now into the 2000s. And they were taken out by um, Jeremy England of MIT, a brilliant scientist, and just out of interest, he had a look at what was in the test tubes. And he discovered, to his amazement, that there were quite a few more amino acids that hadn't been there 50 years before. So Brown gets his mind working and says, right, let's put an AI system to work. That's what it was like in 1953. That's what it was like in the early 2000s. Let's make a database and calculate, well, what's it going to be like in 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, a million years, 10 million years, a billion years, and so on. Now, of course, a lot of it is hype and imagination. But the point is, as he watches his AI system work on this database, 
and he's watching it, and lo and behold, in front of his eyes, the double helix of DNA suddenly appears. So he's solved the mystery of the origin of life. Well, he hasn't actually. And you will find a very detailed expose of this in my book. But it's attractive to people because it seems like the kind of way you would do it. I reject his arguments completely for a very simple reason, that the DNA double-stranded helix is a linguistic, shows linguistic features. It's a code, and natural unguided processes do not produce code. But that's another big story. But now let's come to the next thing. What about the question of the future? Well, of course, he starts off because he's an evolutionary atheist, and he starts off with the points in his database representing, as he understands it, the development of animals and so on in the past. And then he starts, of course, to project them into the future. So he watches his screen as the AI system filters through all this, and he suddenly notices something very odd. I'm afraid this is a spoiler. If you don't like spoilers, you better stop listening. <laughs> because as he watches the screen, he sees another species emerging. And this new species grows and grows until it swallows up humanity. He calls it technium, because it is technology taking over from biological life. Now, what is said in the book is fascinating. He announces this to the world, and he says new technologies like cybernetics, etc., and virtual reality will forever change what it means to be human. And this scientist says, I realize there are those of you who believe as homo sapiens, you are God's chosen species. I can understand that this news, his news, may feel like the end of the world to you. But I beg you, please believe me. The future is actually much brighter than you think. Now, what's at the heart of this, ladies and gentlemen, is a drive to refashion human beings. And that raises profound questions for someone like me, who is a Christian. And it means that we need, in light of this, although most of it is hype and speculation, it's capturing the minds of people. So I think we need to inject into the debate a rethink of what human beings, version 1.0, actually are. So we've got AGI, the singularity, homo deus and technium, all speculation. We're a very little way down the road, but people can now see possibilities because of the success of narrow AGI. So what is a human being? How are we going to think about humanity? Well, I was taught quantum physics years ago at Cambridge by Professor Sir John Polkinghorne. And he writes, if we are to understand the nature of reality, we have only two possible starting points, either the brute fact of the physical world or the brute fact of a divine will and purpose behind that physical world. Two worldviews. Either the atheist worldview, the physical world is all that exists, or the theistic worldview. Well, the atheistic material worldview, we humans, says physicist Sean Carroll, are blobs of organized mud, very flattering, which through the impersonal workings of nature's patterns have developed the capacity to contemplate and cherish and engage with the intimidating complexity of the world around us. The meaning we find in life is not transcendent. Now I want to just pause here for a moment and say to you, why this stuff is really serious is that most of the thinkers, so far as I can ascertain who are working on it, are coming from a naturalistic, atheistic perspective. And you can see 
that if you believe that biological life happened without any divine intervention or input, then surely with human intelligence, we can create artificial life based on silicon. We can enhance by intelligent design the humans that we are at the moment. It's very logical from a materialistic point of view. It is not logical from the biblical point of view, which is in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and God made humans in his own image. Now we'll hold that in our heads for a minute and just think of a very important thing. It's one thing to suggest the brain functions like a computer. It's a very different thing to say it is a computer. Roger Epstein was the editor of Psychology Today. And he is very much against this idea that the human brain is simply a computer made of meat. Computers don't play games like humans play games, and so on. They don't, at their most fundamental level, even solve computational problems like humans do. And I think one of the most important warnings comes from your own Professor Leon Kass, one of the most brilliant public intellectuals in the USA at Chicago, presidential advisor on ethics, and he says this, we have paid some high price for the technological conquest of nature, but none so high as the intellectual and spiritual costs of seeing nature as mere material for our manipulation, exploitation, and transformation. With the powers of biological engineering gathering, there will be splendid new opportunities for similar degradation of our view of man. If we come to see ourselves as meat, then meat we will become. Now against that background, I want to think very briefly with you of the alternative worldview, the biblical perspective. And the Bible announces that we do not have to wait for superintelligence because it already exists. God, the Word, the one who created our universe by speaking it into being so that mind and God and Word are primary and the physical universe is derivative. That's exactly opposite to the assumption that the physical universe is primary and everything else is derivative. And the intriguing thing about the Genesis account of creation is the two days on which God spoke more than once. The third and the sixth. And on the third day, the distinction was between inorganic material and life. You do not get in Scripture a transition from inorganic to organic without the words, and God said. Now, what's that telling us? In modern terminology, it's telling us that the world we regard as the natural world is not a closed system of cause and effect. It was built stepwise by God speaking energy and information from outside an open system and building it up. The second occasion on which God spoke more than once is to differentiate between animals and human beings. You don't get from animals to human beings without and God said. Now I'm going to leave that because I've written a little book on it. That's shameless advertising. <laughs> but I want to come to this key statement. You see, artificial general intelligence will be something created in human image. What we're claiming is that human beings like us were made in God's image. And Genesis lists a whole fascinating collection of properties of what it means to be made in God's image. Now we could spend ages on each of them. Humans are made of the dust of the ground. There's so much material. So are robots. So are artificial intelligences. 
But then humans are alive. And of course, AI systems are not alive. Will they ever be? That is the question. Human beings have an aesthetic sense. And as you look down the list, you will discover that many of these properties depend and are integrated with the fact that human beings are conscious. But we've already seen that robots, in the first place, and AI systems, they are not conscious. And we could pick out a number of fascinating things here, where attempts are being seriously made to imitate some of these properties. Think of the human language facility, that we can name things. Do you know that AI systems regularly write sports reports for our newspapers? That they are making film trailers? That they are constructing art? And it raises all kinds of questions. Where do you differentiate between the two? You're going to be disappointed if you think I'm going to give you a lecture on how to sort all this out. What I'm saying is these are things, ladies and gentlemen, we need to think about. So on the one hand, we have the appearance of intelligence, but it's not conscious and God does something that machinery and clever scientists do not do. He links intelligence and consciousness. And here's the big barrier in constructing a superintelligence. The biggest hurdle is consciousness because no one, no one has any idea what consciousness is. But there's something more. You see, I said that self-driving cars don't have a conscience. So some sort of morality has to be built in. That's the morality of the programmers. So self-driving cars separate intelligence and conscience. AI separates them, but God links them. Because in the Genesis account, we have a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Please, it's not the tree of knowledge. God didn't want to keep people from knowledge. There was loads of it in the garden. This kind of knowledge is a knowledge you don't want to have. And the analysis in Genesis is something that is way beyond any capacity or beginnings of a capacity of an AI system. Because here, God explains to us what it means to be a moral being. In simple terms, they had freedom to eat of all the trees. God said, don't eat of that one. They had freedom to eat, otherwise the prohibition would have been meaningless. And of course, we know the story that they disobeyed God. The first morality was vertical. It was determined by God. Now, this is a huge problem. If you reject God and you're building all kinds of systems that interact with human beings, what morality are you going to build into them? Where are you going to get it from? Because if there isn't a God, I would want to argue that morality ends up being essentially subjective. Now, that's another huge topic. But it's important that we see again what Genesis says because this creature that God built in his image grasped at autonomy and brought sin and disaster into the world. Do you know what many people in the robotics world and AI world fear? Exactly the same thing happening to their creations. And interestingly enough, a leading scientist draws the parallel. And, and she says, if we see the Genesis account of the fall as foreshadowing of fears about robots, then Genesis gets the problem exactly right for exactly the right reasons. It's a worry about autonomy itself. What might robots do if we can't control them fully? And there, of course, she's thinking of robots with AI systems together. We can thank, she says, the Hebrew account of Genesis for pre-warning us about this danger thousands of years ago. So, there has been 
a conference of some of the world's leading thinkers to try and get people to agree to impose morality on any of these developments, lest something gets out of control. One of the leading researchers in the world on artificial intelligence is a Christian believer at MIT. Her name is Rosalind Picard. And she uses AI systems to get into the inner heart of autistic children. And she's done wonderful work in helping those children. And she writes a general point, the greater the freedom of a machine, the more it will need moral standards. So Genesis raises the morality question. There is concern about it, even when talking about hypothetical, superintelligent machines. But there was another tree in the garden, and that is the tree of life. And we remember that one of Harari's propositions was that in this century, we are going to solve the problem of physical death, are we? Because Genesis raises some very interesting points. It tells us that when humans disobeyed God, he removed from them a source of food that if they had had access to it, would have kept them physically alive forever. That's what the text says. And you begin to wonder if the search for physical immortality all goes back to this story, that God excluded them from it. And you've probably read in classical mythology the search for the elixir of life. And now the modern version is the search for homo deus. So Harari projects into the future and his idea is that we're going to upgrade humans into gods. The biblical answer to it is spectacular. Because there is a homo deus, a man who is God. But it's not man becoming God. It's God becoming man. And the heart of the Christian faith is that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Evidenced by his resurrection and his ascension, there is a homo deus. We don't have to wait for Harari or Kurzweil or anybody else to create a man who is God. There is a man who is God. Now, isn't it interesting, ladies and gentlemen, that when someone like Harari or Kearse says, this is going to happen, people say, oh, that's fascinating. But when we claim that there is a man who is God, oh, they say, you couldn't possibly believe that. That's the Bible, isn't it? <laughs> and what I want to argue to you tonight seriously is this. We have come to a very important moment where we can see in our culture ideas that are parodies of what we've already got in the Bible, which gives us a remarkable opportunity to speak into what's going on. Now, one of the hopes of these people, you've probably heard it, is to upgrade ourselves and become more intelligent and all this kind of thing. But you see, there is already in existence a divine upgrade. And phase one is that any one of us, by trusting Christ as Lord and Savior, who died for our sins, can become what we were not by nature, a child of God. That is a spectacular divine upgrade, isn't it? And that can already happen. We don't have to wait for it. We can receive the life of God. And perhaps by looking at it, Against the background of AI, we can see just how remarkable this is. We have something to say to our world. They're searching for it. They're nowhere near it. They're trying to get there. But we can say, look, God has become man. There is a man who is God. He has risen from the dead. And he invites everybody to become children of God, receiving a new life, eternal life, by trusting him. To as many as received him, 
He gave the right to become children of God. The serpent said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall be homodeus. You shall be as gods. Here's the biblical answer to that. God doesn't want to suppress anybody. He wants to make us his children in his family with the same kind of life as he has got. But there's more. The homodeus was here. He's left. He's returning. And publicly to his judges, Jesus said, you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of God and coming on the clouds of heaven. Privately to his disciples, he said, this same, it was said to his disciples, this same Jesus shall so come as you saw him go. Homo Deus is going to return. Now let's listen to a famous atheist, John Gray, who's always worth reading. Humans may well use science to turn themselves into something like gods, as they have imagined them to be. But no supreme being will appear in the scene. Instead, there will be many different gods, each of them a parody of human beings that once existed. He's wrong. I will come again. And I will take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So how far have we got? The AGI people are speculating on the creation of hum homo deus by human engineering and intellectual ability. Scripture claims that a superintelligence has always existed, God, and God has become human, and there is a homo deus. Jesus, the God-man, the word become flesh, but there's more. And now it becomes even more fascinating because the Bible talks of a future homo deus that is evil. This is Paul writing in the first century to a church at Thessalonica. Listen to what he has to say. And bear in mind when I read it that he was only in this city for three weeks. And he reminded the people that when he was there, he told them this stuff. What had he told them? For that day will not come. That is the day of judgment. Will not come until the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And then, the lawless one, this is not civil lawlessness, this is spiritual lawlessness, it's rebellion against God, the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and deceptions. Now that's chilling reading. But I want to put it in the context of what a professor of physics at MIT is saying about the future. Max Tegmark, a very bright man. And when he comes to AGI, he's got various scenarios of what might happen. For example, human cyborgs, uploads, and superintelligence might coexist peacefully. There might be a protector god. That is where AI becomes essentially omniscient. We don't want to ignore that, ladies and gentlemen. Many young people today cannot do without being connected to the machine that knows everything, more or less, that they've ever done. It's called the Internet of Things. And AI will become very rapidly, and has become, a substitute God. That's another big social story. But then he's got another idea of an enslaved God. A superintelligent AI is confined by humans. But then the next one is AI takes control. Decides that humans are a threat, a nuisance, or waste of resource, and gets rid of us by a method that we don't even understand. And he's got 12 scenarios. Here's the one that interests him most. I was intrigued when I discovered this. He calls it the Omega Project, 
For the first time ever, our planet was run by a single power called Prometheus, amplified by an intelligence so vast that it could potentially enable life to flourish for billions of years throughout the cosmos. But what specifically was their plan? And he goes on to indicate this Prometheus one massive feature is complete social and economic control of buying and selling. Now listen to the book of Revelation, written 20 centuries ago. Now this is imagery, but listen to it. It, that is the beast, deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all to be marked on their right hand so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark that is the name of the beast and the number of his name. People often laugh at that. But this is the very scenario that will flow out of the current social control AI systems in China, which Tegmark singles out as an example of what might happen in the future. People say, but this is imagery, but just a minute. They obviously haven't listened to C.S. Lewis. Because C.S. Lewis points out that imagery and metaphor always stand for reality. There's always a reality behind them. So if we ask, what is this beast? The book of Revelation gives the answer in the very same context. Let's listen to it. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who is understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Please notice what it's not saying. It's not telling you who it is. It's telling you what it is. The beast is human. That is the central message of this. You know, historically, people have tried to decode this gematria, putting numbers for letters and work out who it is, and they've been spectacularly successful. Hitler has been in, Stalin's been in, virtually everybody. But that isn't the point. Because you see, if this human who behaves like a beast is revealed by the power of Satan and controls the whole world, you'll not have to play guessing games with numbers to know who it is. It'll be obvious. The 666 will simply be a check. Do we take it seriously? This is the way that Tegmark starts his book talking about Prometheus. Here we have it in scripture. Why shouldn't we take scripture seriously? I see no reason why not to. I see increasing reason to do that. That's the negative side. And it clearly is not a very pleasant prospect, although we can see what's happening in our world is moving very rapidly towards it. It is highly credible. And it's credible... Because Paul said to these people, it's already working in your own society. The Caesars were calling themselves gods. And they were insisting that the Christians bow down and worship. And many a Christian lost his or her life for refusing to do it. Now he says, you watch the trends in your society. This deification of emperors. Watch where it goes. This is where it's going to go to. And here are the AGI people telling us exactly the same thing on the basis of our speculations. I think we need to take these texts much more seriously than we've ever done in the past. But there's good news, you know, because there's a divine upgrade phase two. <laughs> phase one is becoming children of God through receiving Christ. Phase two is spectacular. Because it is a transformation. It's not bioengineering. This is what it is. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, 
and we shall be changed. This mortal must put on immortality. That is a wonderful hope in the midst of all of this. Now, let's just concluding now, come down to balance. Here is a statement of a book that came out just recently, one of the world's top AI researchers. And here's his honest assessment. AI can handle a growing number of non-personal, non-creative routine tasks, but the skills that make us uniquely human are ones that no machine can replicate. The jobs of the future will require creative, compassionate, empathetic leaders who know how to create trust, to build teams, and inspire service and communicate effectively. So I would sum up, ladies and gentlemen, by saying, firstly, that fear of AGI should not prevent people of any worldview making a contribution to the positive aspects of narrow AI to the benefit of all. And Rosalind Pickard put it this way, we've decided it's more about building a better human-machine combination than it is about building a machine where we will be lucky if it wants us around as a household pet. <laughs> In the middle of my talk, I went to Genesis. Why do we believe that humans are special? Here's why we believe it the ultimate affirmation of humanity version 1.0 is the fact that God became one. The word became flesh. And the result of the incarnation, the death of the and the resurrection of Jesus, that instead of speculative hope that one day we can upload the contents of our brains or we can be bioengineered to live forever, we have a sure and certain hope based on the true homo deus that to as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become children of God. And we can lift up our heads in confidence for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. This mortal must put on immortality. That is the future of the Christian believer, ladies and gentlemen. And it is light years more credible and better than anything speculative AGI has to offer. Thank you very much indeed.